You want to you do the intro today? Sure, fuck it. Hi, welcome to For We Are Many. This is part 13 of our piece on the Black Panther Party and dialectical materialism. We've been reading Bobby Seale's book, Seize the Time. Thank you for joining us. My name is Trisha, and this is Rob. Hello. How y'all doing out there? <laughs> All right, we're going to dive right on in here. We left off on page 213. Uh, if you're following along in the, the file that we have on Google Drive of the book, um, we left off at the section called Rules of the Black Panther Party. And this came out of the national headquarters in Berkeley, California. Do you want to go first, Rob, or you want me to? I'll go first. I don't care. Oh, for um, before we dive right in, though, uh, maybe, you know, give people time to pull up the book if they're following along. But um, yeah. I just wanted to talk a little bit about what's going on because our schedule's kind of wonky this coming week. And I, I just want to make sure that everybody knows uh, the current event stream is no longer going to be on Monday. It will be on Tuesday. Um, that, of course, will still be live. Um, pretty much everything else, though, we're trying to do pre-recorded so that way we can put them out more regularly, uh, not have to worry about doing it the day of. I think it'll make a lot less headache for all of us involved on our end. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah, we're definitely going to keep that going with the labor history pieces on Wednesdays. Um, more Black Panther Party stuff to come on Thursdays, too, because when we finish this book, we're going to start on Eldridge Cleaver's book. So and on Ice is the title of that. Yep. And the other, thank you for that. Uh, the other section of the left leftist book club that we're doing, um, instead of being on Tuesdays will now be on Mondays and we are diving into Emma Goldman's piece. What is it? Anarchism and, and other, other essays. essays yeah. yes. um, so that won't be next Monday. That'll be the Monday following the that. Following. Yeah. Right. Which gives us a little time to get these pre-recorded pieces done ahead of time so we can properly promote them. <laughs> um, as well as kicking them out for early release for our Patreon patrons. Yes. Yes. And on top of that, um, I started a, well, actually, it, it will have started by the time this airs. So yeah, <laughs> today I started a... Uh, uh, promotion for our patreon things anyone who becomes a patron by the end of the month will either i mean it says a one-on-one -on -one, like we we do a personalized video for it i think a better way to do it would be to get you in a zoom meeting with us and do like a one-on-one -on -one, you know that way but uh either way that is uh I know it's nothing tangible yet, but you know, at least it, it's something. We've been trying to figure out what we can do for our Patreons and these are, or I mean, I'm sorry, what we can do for our patrons. And these are the things that we've come up with so far. But yeah, that promotion will be running till the end of the month. Um, we might do a different promotion next month, depending on what our options are. Um, yeah, so, uh, anarchism and other essays will be on Mondays, not this coming week, but the following week. Um, and we'll take a, we're going to take a week off at the end of this book as well, which if we finish it today, then obviously next Thursday will be off. And then the following Thursday will be into soul on ice. Um, but we might finish it today, but if we don't, then it'll be the, the <laughs> Thursday after that. Right. Except for our patrons. You'll get to see it next Thursday. <laughs> or earlier. Or earlier, yeah. Depending yeah. on when we get that recorded. Um, also, since we were just talking about our anarchism and other essays piece, um, much like all of our stuff, um, 
live stuff at least that we've done lately uh it'll also be available on um left signal boost on facebook and uh as well as our platforms obviously and um anarchism and other essays will also be featuring um the host of bread theory which is another leftist podcast they're more focused on anarchist content and i think that this relationship will be a good thing because we kind of felt awkward doing anarchism without an anarchist for perspective um and he kind of felt the same way about what he's been doing with the principles of communism so <laughs> we're cross-pollinating blowing our loads on each other oh my <laughs> Anyway, hey, it's, uh, that's what the plants do. <laughs> you're right. We're just cucumbers with anxiety. You're not wrong. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, I guess it's about time we can we can dive into the text now. Absolutely. Um, every member of the Black Panther Party throughout this country of racist America must abide by these rules as functional members of this party. Central committee members, central staffs, and local staffs, including all captains subordinate, uh, subordinate, sorry, to either national, state, or local leadership of the Black Panther Party will enforce these rules. Length of suspension, suspension, I already can't talk, wow, or <laughs> other disciplinary action necessary for violation of these rules will depend on national decisions by national, state, or state area and local committees and staffs where said rule or rules of the Black Panther Party were violated. Wow, that's that sounds like lawyers speak there, don't it? A little bit. Hey, they learned a lot from Charlie. <laughs> yeah, right, right, for sure. Um, every member of the party must know these verbatim by heart and apply them daily. Each member must report any violation of these rules to their leadership or they are counter-revolutionary and are also subject to suspension by the Black Panther Party. The rules are, number one, no party member can have narcotics or weed in his possession while doing party work. Um, I completely understand that for the time. This is before the war on drugs, but they knew what was coming. Right. And uh, the media has always tried to associate weed with laziness in black people or laziness in Mexicans or Right. late laziness and any non-white people um right two. but yeah look at snoop dog how fucking productive he is <laughs> this is true anyway this is true. one of the biggest potheads of our time productive <laughs> as fuck <laughs> number two any party member found shooting narcotics will be expelled from this party i understand that they're a liability at that point they're probably going to try to steal something at some point. But I also feel like there should have been a means of outreach or, or you know, help rather than just cutting them off from, you know, possibly the only socialization that they have. But I understand where the rule comes from. All right. Maybe go get some help and then come back when you're clean. Right. Number three. No party member can be drunk, that's in all capitals, while doing daily party work. Well, I mean. Yeah. Have you been around drunk people? <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of hard to get serious and do some work when you're drunk. Better yet, have you tried to talk politics with drunk people? Yes, that doesn't really go well. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> number four no party member will violate rules relating to office work in other words you know no like not doing your office work general right. meetings of the black panther party aka show up to the fucking meetings <laughs> and meetings of the black panther party anywhere <laughs> pretty straightforward number five. Oh, you were gonna say something I was just nodding my head like, yep. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Number five. Uh, 
No party member will use, point, or fire a weapon of any kind unnecessarily or accidentally at anyone. That's just the means of holding accountability. Right. Which, with how controversial it was for a group of black men to be carrying firearms to begin with, it, like how controversial that was, especially at that time, that's a very important rule. It probably should have been number one. Right. Right. It's very important. Like, you don't draw your gun unless you need to use it. Right. It is not for intimidation. It is for protection. Right. Um, number six. No party member can join any other army force than the Black Liberation Army, which maybe the Thursday that we're, uh, while we're gearing up for Soul on Ice, we could do a, a Thursday historical piece on the Black Liberation Army. Maybe. I don't I'm know. down with that. We should bring it up to the rest okay. of the committee, but I think it would be a good idea. Hell yeah. And, and I mean, especially since a lot of the people we'd be talking about are, you know, still very much alive. Right. Might not be in the U.S., but alive. <laughs> Number seven. No party member can have a weapon in his possession while drunk or loaded off narcotics or weed. Um, they're just trying to prevent felony charges there, ultimately. Um, right. we, all, we all know how the uh, ATF views weed, even though, you know, I, I mean, putting it in the same class with other narcotics is ridiculous. But that being said, yeah. they were just trying to protect their members from potentially life in prison. Um, it's... A lot of these rules are pretty common sense, though, really. Right. I'm scanning through here. It's like, yeah, a lot of this is just have some damn ethics. Yeah. Number eight. No party member will commit any crimes against any other party members or black people at all and cannot steal or take from the people, not even a needle or a piece of thread. And, and I mean, they've been very clear on this. Uh, you know, like if you are really in need, they will figure out how to put a roof over your head. They will right. figure out how to make sure that you have food in your gut, but don't fucking steal from your, you know, your people. Don't do it. Right. Uh, There's no cause to. Needs right. will be met. So long as you're doing good work, your needs will be met. Yep. Be a fucking thief. Number nine, when arrested, Black Panther members will give only name, address, and will sign nothing. Legal first aid must be understood by all party members. Pretty straightforward. Yep. Number, number 10, this also could have been, you know, number one. The 10 point program and platform of the Black Panther Party must be known and understood by each party member. That's that's pretty important. Right. Um, so important, actually. Well, you'll see in a minute. Number 11, party communications must be national and local. In other words, the national should know what's going on at the <laughs> local, and the local should know what's going on at the national. This is... Um, their ideas for a system of governance understood something that our system still doesn't. <laughs> right. Open communication, real transparency. Right. And then number 12, we're going back to number 10. The 10 point program should be known by all members <laughs> and also <laughs> understood by all members. They just had to reiterate that one. Yeah. <laughs> Like that's how fucking important that is. <laughs> yeah, I see it why it wasn't number one. Because it's number 10 and 12. Yep. Uh, number 13. All finance officers will operate under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Finance. Pretty straightforward. <laughs> yep. 
and uh, all finance officers operating under the jurisdiction of the Ministry of Finance would report to the Minister of Finance on the Central Committee, if there's any confusion as to how that works. Um, number 14, each person will submit a report of daily work. And that's why there was so much office work to do at the national headquarters right there. All right. <laughs> And I, I mean, that's so much easier to do now. Can you imagine what the Black Panther Party could have done with those individuals with access to social media and the internet? Right. Hell, even without social media, just having the internet access to be able to share those files. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Think um, of what they could have done with Excel and Drive. <laughs> yeah, for real, for real. They'd probably use up the uh, free storage pretty quick, but. Yeah. They better have lots of backup space on your computer, but still. Uh, or, you know, like the funds to pay for unlimited storage. Right. Um, so number 15, uh, this is also pretty self-explanatory. Each subsection leader section leader lieutenant and captain must submit daily reports of work weird like they had to reiterate that the leadership needs to do it just like everybody else and they even put it right back to back like that right like you are not above this <laughs> right you are included in each person uh number 16 also pretty damn important uh, all Panthers must learn to operate and service weapons correctly. Pretty self-explanatory. Number 17. Right. Number 17. All leadership personnel who expel a member must submit this information to the editor of the newspaper so that it will be published in the paper and will be known by all chapters and branches. And we saw in last week's episode exactly why that's fucking important. Right. Um, because people were getting kicked out of a branch or a chapter and just going to a different chapter until they started publishing it in the paper. Right. So they were trying to pull the same shit. Right. Um, number 18, political education classes are mandatory for general membership. Yep. Number, if you don't know the ethics and the philosophy and the history, how can you stand for it? Right. Right. I think it's after the rules, but there's something I'm really looking forward to. Yes, it is. Okay. Well, we'll get there in a few minutes. Um, number 19. Only office personnel assigned to respective offices each day should be there. All others are to sell papers and do political work out in the community, including captain, section leaders, etc. So the, the papers are A, to spread awareness and make some money, um, which, you know, the, the young men and women that were typically selling the papers got almost all of the money that each paper made. It was like the paper sold for a dollar and they did the breakdown somewhere, damn it. Do you remember what the breakdown was? I want to say they were actually selling them for 25 cents a piece, and only five cents of that was going to the house. The rest was going to the people doing the footwork. Yeah, There's you're right, like you're that. right. I don't know why I was thinking a dollar. Probably because newspapers Maybe are, putting it in today's money. Yeah, way more expensive <laughs> now. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's important in the political work. Uh, I mean, I wish that they would have done more elaborating on what they viewed as political work um, in the book. But I also understand how much that would have added to the book. Right. Um, so, I mean, I get why they didn't. Um, but no, seriously, getting out and actually doing the work in the community. Period. Number 20, communications. All chapters must submit weekly reports in what writing to the national headquarters. So, you know, like each chapter takes the daily reports um, from its members 
and then submits that to the national headquarters or submits probably a summary of that to the national headquarters. Yeah. 21 is also very, I mean, honestly, all of these rules are pretty damn important in their own ways, but uh, number 21, all branches must implement first aid and or medical cadres. I'll never understand how they had professionally trained nurses and doctors in the numbers that they did. Um, but we need to figure out how to bring those types of people into the left and willing to serve the community too. All right. Uh, number 22, all chapters, branches, and components of the Black Panther Party must submit a monthly financial report to the Ministry of Finance and also the Central Committee. I would assume how that would work is that you send it to the minister uh, to the Ministry of Finance, and then the Minister of Finance would take it to the Central Committee. Uh, number 23, everyone in a leadership position must read what must read no less than two hours per day to keep abreast of the changing political situation and i mean i think it's safe to say that all of us in our committee do that <laughs> right a lot goes into it I mean, yeah we gotta keep abreast of everything happening right sure. and, I, and i mean you know we're trying to read backwards in terms of theory and we're trying to read forwards in terms of current events and we're trying to figure out how to like put these ideas into practice in today's world and there's a lot of reading that goes into it there's a lot of thought that goes into it right um number 24 no chapter or branch shall accept grants poverty funds money or any other aid from any government agency without contacting the national headquarters pretty straightforward they want to know where the money's coming from Mm -hmm. If you get government money and you all of a sudden start acting funny, hmm. Right. Uh, number 25, all chapters must adhere to the policy and ideology laid down by the Central Committee of the Black Panther Party. Uh, they're about to talk a little bit more about the ideology, so I'm not going to really tack anything onto that other than to say we're getting to that. Number 26. Right. All branches must submit weekly reports in writing to the respective chapters. So you have the central committee, right? And then you have national headquarters, and then you have the chapters, and then you have the branches. So, I mean, it's just going up the chain. Weekly writings, or weekly reports in writing. Yeah. That way they keep that open line of communication. It's and that fucking important. Yeah. You got to know what everybody's getting done, especially, okay, if you're even just looking at the numbers of where papers are being sold more, you can see where there needs to be more effort placed for other areas of the same population size to be able to sell more papers, etc. It's all important for analyzing everything that they need to do. Hello? Anything. Uh... The next section is called Women in the Black Panther Party. In the Black Panther Party, we understand that male chauvinism is directly related to the class society. In order to explain how the party deals with male chauvinism, I want to point out how the party thinks and how the party understands things. The ideology of the party is the whole, ex the whole historical experience of Black people in America, the experience of all the social evils that have trampled on our heads and caused us to be oppressed. The historical experience of Black people translated through Marxism-Leninism is really the ideology of the Black Panther Party. The history of the party is a process of putting into practice the basic revolutionary principles that we've acquired. And these principles not only relate to the economic and social evils, but they're also caught up in the economic and social evils in this system that oppress black people. These social evils are created and maintained by this capitalistic government, which is infested with a lot of ruling class elite, greedy businessmen and demagogic politicians. In the party itself, there has always been on the part of party members, the same kind of progressive changing experience in terms of being one with the people. 
We need to establish a system based on the goal of absolute equality of all people. And this must be established on the principle of from each and every person, male and female, according to their ability and to each and every person, both male and female, according to their needs. We see establishing socialism in the society as a means by which we begin to remove the oppressive social obstacles and hope to build a society where someday a man and woman can relate to each other totally on the bias or basis of natural attraction. When we study other societies, and you must understand the society that you live in to talk about any of the aspects of the groups which live in poverty within that society, we see that there is a consistently changing culture that exists amongst these people in poverty and their economic, political, and social situation is directly related to our everyday lives. When Eldridge and Huey and the party as a whole move to get rid of male chauvinism, we're moving on that principle of absolute equality between the male and female because male chauvinism is related to the very class nature of the society as it exists today. And even in the party, there are relationships between male and female that have to be ironed out to a level where it makes some sense. The party is working very hard and fast to break down male chauvinism. At the same time that we are moving on this matter in relation to the community, we are also moving and changing in relation to ourselves. There are some fine sisters in the party, Kathy, Marsha, and some others, who were walking in front of a little barber shop two doors down from the national headquarters in Berkeley. It's a shop where a lot of brothers, many of whom, that sorry, that was my phone, a text coming through. Um, <laughs> It, it's a shop where a lot of brothers, many of whom have just recently come out of the joint, go to get processes on their heads. Some of these brothers call themselves pimps, and you can figure that some of them at one point or another are pushing weed or something, the type of activities the black men are driven to trying to live. These brothers are playing their old game, saying to each other, man, I know I can rap to one of the Panther sisters and take all those chicks away from all the cats over there in the Panther office. Now, this is an old game that's related to male chauvinism, to the brother dominating the sister. What's th what that's related to, as Malcolm X put it one time, is that the president is the biggest pimp in the country. And this pimp and the sister on the block is related to continued existence of a class system. It's cross-related to the economic problems in the Black community, where the male is put into a position where he can't really be the breadwinner for the home. So when the sisters walked in front of the little barber shop, I noticed some brothers were huddled among each other, speculating on the Panther sisters. They tried to rap to Marsha and a couple of the other sisters and Marsha set them straight. She said, look, brother, you're getting none of this. You don't use this on the streets either. The only way you can get close to me is to get hip to some of the real ideology of the Black Panther Party. Then another sister said, yeah, if you wanna get next to us, why don't you check out the red book? Well, those brothers were a little shocked. Then the other brothers inside the place started laughing at the brothers outside. Well, this got off with the brothers. It seemed like the whole barbershop got upset, not in an antagonistic manner, but wanted to know what it was that didn't allow these sisters to go for that old pimp game. Naturally, their speculation was that the sisters made love to us and therefore they agreed with our rap. What they didn't understand is that you can't define it in terms of what kind of rap is going down, that it was the ideology of the party that was helping to bring us out of that very same kind of thinking. So their curiosity was aroused and the brothers uh, tried rapping with some of the other sisters and got the same answers. The next thing I knew, all those brothers had come over to the party headquarters 25 or 30 of them to buy some Panther literature and some red books. They stopped talking and started listening. And the sisters laid the revolutionary ideology right on. We had tried for a long time in a lot of ways to get these brothers motivated, but it took some sisters with a new and respectful way of looking at themselves to bring these brothers in. Down in LA over a year ago, Brother Bunchy Carter had put up six offices in the black community, which attracted hundreds and hundreds of members. 
Now, not all of them, but some were coming around the party office with wine in their heads. When Bunchy went down to one of the offices, he'd catch them walking up to the door. They were supposed to have been there at 10, but were coming along at noon or later. Bunchy used to call them the drunk for lunch bunch. Bunchy would say, who do you think you are? Don't you know that these fascist pigs are here to murder us? And don't you know that we are surrounded by imperialistic wolves who murder and kill and commit genocide against black people? And here you fools come up late and drunk for lunch. What's wrong with you? So Bunchy, trying to cross-relate our principles on the level of our everyday lives, asked all the sisters to turn a cold shoulder to all these fools who came around late and the ones who didn't do any work. The Minister of Defense, Bunchy explained, is going to start kicking them all out, and I'm going to start kicking them out right now. Will you sisters help the party? These cats aren't doing any revolutionary work, but are wanting to go to bed with you, talking about how much they love you. But they must not love you very much at all because they aren't doing revolutionary work so you can be free. Well, the sister dug that. Bunchy had to expel a few of the sisters and brothers who were lazy and just didn't want to do the work in the office in the community that is necessary to run a chapter of the Black Panther Party. But mostly they straightened up and got down to work. Originally, we had established rank in the Black Panther Party according to the political work and political duties of each member. A captain was generally a coordinator. That was his political duty. We judged a person on whether or not he took responsibility because one of the party's principles is that you can delegate authority, but you cannot delegate responsibility. Lieutenants were security people and sergeants were section leaders. Corporals were subsection leaders. Excuse me. A regular Panther with no special rank was one who was out of training and a buck private was a Panther in training. Privates were Panthers who had completed the training, which was six weeks of party political education classes. We had originally structured this all the way up to the assistant central staff with the chief of staff. But very soon we discovered that we were running into some problems with this system. For instance, in some office back east, a brother had been made the deputy minister of health and didn't even know how to put on a bandage. We had to straighten that out right away and show chapters they shouldn't give people a certain rank just to fill out a spot. Finally, we had dropped the system and stopped relating to rank altogether. But these problems are related to how some brothers, but not all some, not all but some, had a tendency to misuse the rank concept in relation to the sisters. We found that every once in a while, you'd get a brother calling a sister counter-revolutionary. And the sisters were getting mad about that because it seemed to be related only to the fact that the sisters didn't want to sleep with the brother. In other words, a brother would try to get next to his sister, and when the sister didn't dig him, he'd run around saying she was counter-revolutionary. Some of the brothers said erroneous things like, I'm in the streets and I have to defend you. Some would say, I'm a captain, so it's your duty to give in to me. Wow. that's some rapey shit right there. That's yeah. called. That's fucking disturbing. I'd be booting them the fuck out of the party with the quickness. Like, how dare you speak to her like that? <laughs> Hell no. Uh, we broke this stuff up right away and placed it forth the brothers who were captains or any other rank couldn't be used in their rank just to go to bed with a sister. That shouldn't have even needed to be said. But goddamn. Um, At the same time, it didn't go just one way. A few of the sisters had a tendency to go along with this. Finally, one or two of them began to speak out, and we definitely got rid of this particular kind of male chauvinism. The main thing that the brothers had to understand was that no one had any right to speak of a sister as a counter-revolutionary on any personal basis, or to say that he had a defender. The way we see it, the sister is also a revolutionary, and she has to be able to defend herself just like we do. She has to learn to shoot just like we do, because the pigs in the system don't care that she's a sister. They brutalize her just the same. I think that since the pig structure has been trying to kill Erica Muggins, brothers have begun to see that sisters can get arrested too, just the same as brothers. 
I know that the community can see this in the recent shootout in L.A., where the sisters were in there too, battling, defending, just as hard as the brothers. A lot of the brothers in the black so, community. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I just wanted to interject a little bit to say that that this is one of the biggest critiques that I have seen about the Black Panther Party is their their problem with misogyny. But I want to point out that the Central Committee and the National Headquarters were doing everything that they possibly could, in, including you know stating the obvious that shouldn't have even had to be said that it's not okay. Don't fucking act like this, or you're gone. Right. They were right. at least doing something about it. Like, no, we're not going to fucking allow this bullshit in our organization. Right. Like, this is unacceptable. If you act like this, you're done. Bye. Exactly. I just wanted to point that out. You That's know? all. Right. I I think it's um, the best thing they could have done to address that and actually be honest about, yeah, we actually experienced this problem and had to take these actions to resolve it. You know, denying that something is a problem doesn't help. Saying we're not just trying to change this outside of our organization in the world. We are being the change that we want to see. We're taking that positive yeah. action ourselves. <clears throat> right. And it's they were hard. willing to be held accountable by the people. And they were willing to be held accountable by women. Yep. And they knew that they had a duty to do there to make sure that that type of bullshit wasn't going to be allowed there. Right. It's uncalled for. It's unethical. And they were about ethical actions, ethical behavior well, across the board. They were about ethical actions, but I mean, they were they were very much a Marxist Leninist organization. And I don't think that, you know, like. I haven't seen Judas and the Black Messiah, so I can't say there, but they portrayed Bobby, uh, Bobby Seal and trial of the Chicago seven. And they never once, you know, even closely referred to him as a as a. Marxist Leninist. They call them a revolutionary. Yeah. Right. But they, who knows? Fucking Hollywood probably would have found that a little too inflammatory to be that fucking honest. Um, you know? But I mean, when, when we see like documentaries and stuff about the Black Panther Party, they don't talk about that. I mean, they, they do kind of. Because it, it's a core part of their formation. It, it is the exactly. basis of their values. Right. They, you know. They were Marxist Leninists with Mao Zedong thought. Uh huh. Yep. They wanted true egalitarian fucking society that has ethical equality. Um, you know, and I, I can see where even Emma Goldman would have agreed with them <laughs> of you can't just have She would have agreed with them until men. they seized the state. That's ultimately what it comes down to. She would have been fighting for their cause for sure. Right. Until and, until they seized the state. <laughs> right. It, it was a matter though of, you know, understanding it's not just bringing women on the same level as men equality, but bringing everyone in the lower classes and the working classes to the same level of equality with the upper classes of getting rid of classism altogether. Right. right. And, and I, I mean, beautiful. I feel like the Black Panther Party has better praxis than almost revol uh, any revolutionary movement that I've really dug into. I mean, especially I here in the United States, but I mean, right. their actions hold up with, you know, Cuba. Right. Well, honestly, that's a big part of why a lot of the original Black Panther Party members now live in Cuba and have for a long fucking time because it was one place where they could go for political asylum. Yeah. Political fucking life. You know? Hell, Assad is still there, from what I understand. Yeah. Because there at least has safety and security. You know, she ain't alone. There's quite a few who 
went there and I don't blame him. I've kind of got the same frame of mind. Like, I, I would much rather live somewhere where I'm not looked at like, oh my God, what's wrong with you for being a communist? Right, <laughs> right. Like, what's wrong with you for being a capitalist and wanting to exploit the fuck out of people? Excuse me? Well, right, <laughs> you know? and I mean, you know, especially when people claim they're capitalists and it's like, do you work for a living? You, you ain't no right. capitalist. You ain't got no capital. Right. Capitalists have enough capital that they don't actually have to work. They just designate other people to work for them. They let their money make more money for them. Yes. Fuck. Anywho, back to the book. <laughs> um <laughs> A lot of the brothers in the black community who only think of the sisters as secondary, brothers who are pimping sisters and think that this is the way of, that life has to be, have begun to see the examples that are being set by the Black Panther Party are more progressive. They are seeing, uh, they see us winning on a higher level and treating the sisters on an equal level. The brothers in the community see the sisters don't want to oppress us. What they really want is equality. They want to be treated like human beings. And we found that the sisters work better in the party when they're treated in this way. Well, who would have thought? Treat you like a human being. Uh-huh. Yeah. Um, and we found that the sisters work better in the party when they're treated this way. If a sister's in charge and taking responsibility to do something, the brothers follow her orders. They don't say, I ain't going to listen to no woman. We did have problems of that sort until we politically educated some of them and we finally had to purge our hearts and as Eldridge says, purge our souls and purge our minds in relation to the old environmental conditioning. So with this attitude, the sisters related to the brothers even more, not on the basis of who's the cutest and who's the handsomest. Personal relations are now based more on knowing people personally and humanly, on people coming and working together and functioning in the party. Now, when men and women meet each other, their relation comes out of common interests, common goals, to function in the party as revolutionaries. There was an incident that happened when this kind of change was just beginning to take place. My wife and I had just moved to one of the Panther houses in Berkeley, there were three other bedrooms in the house and some party members found from out of town were staying there. One of these brothers had been working closely with a particular sister for several days, living and working there at the house. He really liked the sister and she kind of dug him too. So one night after my wife and I had gone to bed, there came a knock on our door. Chairman Bobby, the sister called. I said, yes. Can I ask you a question? Sure, I said. I got up, put my pants on, and walked out. What is it? She said, if a brother doesn't know the 10-point platform and program, I shouldn't give him any, should I? And I said, well, wait a minute now. Do you like the cat? Yeah, she said. I dig him, but I'm not going to give him any unless he knows the 10-point platform and program. What are you trying to do? We got in bed, you see, and I asked him if he knew the 10-point platform program. He said he did, so I sat there drilling him, and he missed about 10 words. He didn't say it exactly. I didn't smile. This was serious to the sister, and because of that, it was serious to me, too. So without making any male chauvinistic statements, I just said, not all the brothers are going to be able to know it exactly word for word, but they might be able to know in a general sense what they're about. Maybe the brother explains it in his own words. She said, well, I thought that everybody in the party should know the 10-point platform and program by heart. No, I explained, not necessarily. What we meant when we said that every party member had to know the 10-point platform and program by heart was we put high responsibility on you to really study and understand it. But if what, But what if you knew all the words just right and still didn't understand the meaning of it? Would that do you any good? She shook her head. Well, I went on. If you could say the platform and the program in your own words and what it was all about, each one of the 10 points of what we want and believe, why that's even better. Your own words are more related to your everyday life and would have more meaning to you. So if the brother doesn't know the words just exactly, that doesn't mean he doesn't know the platform. But don't you like the cat? 
sure, I like him lots and I really wanna make love to him, but I'm not gonna trump over the party's ideology. Well, I explained some of the brothers learn slowly, you know, and they know making love a lot better than anything else. <laughs> That's hilarious. Man, what a what a wingman. Right? <laughs> right? Like they know that. Fuck. <laughs> now while I was explaining this to the sister, the brother had grabbed up a pillow and blanket to go downstairs. He said, I'm gonna find a sister in the party I dig who doesn't know the program any better than I do, and we're gonna have some real equality. In a way, of course, this is all funny to me, but the sister was very serious. She didn't want him to just run on over her and not pay attention to the things that were important to her. But the sister that night called the brother back upstairs and told him she understood things a little differently, and she really did care about it. This is one example of the kinds of things that happened between people in the party when we began to deal with the issue of male chauvinism. Well, it's going to happen. When you start dealing a, with issues, there's going to be conflict about those issues. Mm-hmm. And I think that was handled beautifully, you know? Oh, yeah. Uh, Especially the way that Bobby, you know, like, talked about it without cracking up. Like... <laughs> right. It's like, hey, this is even better if you can put it in your own words. That means you understand the concept. You can apply it. Right. And he wasn't you like... Know? And he wasn't like... I guess he kind of was mansplaining, but she asked him for his opinion. Right. She wanted to know his take on that and how he perceived that. And he gave it to her straight, right. you know, um, like, no, he obviously understands it. He's just not doing rote memorization of it, you know? <laughs> right. Better to understand the concept than only remember the words. Uh, let's see. There we, there we go. Uh, people came from all over the country to attend the National Committee to Combat Fascism Conference, and every Panther house in the Bay Area was crowded way past capacity. People were sleeping on the floors on pallets and sleeping bags on couches and beds, and even in the hallways. Over at Eldridge Cleaver's house, all the bedrooms were occupied and people were sleeping down on the living room and dining room floors. One of the sisters sent in a complaint to party headquarters saying that a brother had attempted to rape her. As we investigated this, it turned out that the brother had come into the room and, and had gotten into the bed where she was sleeping in her clothes. It wasn't uncommon when it was as crowded as that for a brother and sister to sleep next to each other. And she told him it was okay to sleep there. Well, it seems that he got sexually aroused from sleeping so close to her and tried to get a little too close. But she pushed him away from her and he simply quit trying. So we pointed out that since she had been able to just push him away, this wasn't really attempted rape. And she realized that it wasn't. These are the kind of problems we come up with and still do. We try to get rid of these petty problems. We try to teach the brothers and sisters the basic party principles and how to use these principles to relate to each other. The problems between the brothers and sisters relate to past conditioning. In a situation where a brother and sister are lying beside each other, past social conditioning has taught that a brother, that brother that he can use force on the sister and take her without caring about her feelings on the matter. Now the brother must learn that he has no right to use any kind of force on that sister, and she must watch herself for her own attitude and not see everything he's doing as force, because that's the kind of conditioning she's had. We had to make more rules in the party because a number of similar incidents came up. One of those rules was that the brothers had better not use any force on any sister in the party. It hasn't been all smooth and easy getting these rules across. A year and a half ago, when this started, it even got to the point where a sister was hit by a brother. She fell back and her heel was cut by a piece of glass that broke when she fell on it. It was a struggle to stop this kind of thing. Where, where the sister was previously regulated to typing and cooking and stuff like this, we broke up those roles in the party. That was a struggle too. We even had to deal with the way brothers talk to sisters. Sorry, uh, I can, uh, because every once in a while, 
We'd catch a brother talking to his sister in such a harsh manner that it really scared her. Enough so she'd do anything he said. The sisters brought these complaints up. We told the brothers, we're tired of that. We're not going to have that in the party. We're not going to have any kind of messing over these sisters. I think that the sisters began to respect the party much more for these things, seeing that the brothers wanted to treat them as human beings and not necessarily subordinate to us. Well, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I, I mean, like, and it shouldn't have been a controversial thing for them to, I don't know if I want to call these reforms, but to, to put these kind of rules in place. I mean, I think that the initial group right. of people thought that this shit was common fucking sense. Right. Right. Anybody who was raised with ethics would see that as common sense. Um, so, I, you know, at least he's acknowledging there that a lot of this comes from being conditioned to those things by other parts of society. And it's like, wait a minute. No, just because you are conditioned to it doesn't make it right. You don't get to do that shit. Right. Right. You know? I mean, they acknowledge that it's a problem, but they also didn't say, yes, you can fucking rape because... That's what your conditioning is. Of course not. No, no. They were saying that might explain your attitude, but it'll never excuse your fucking behavior. You don't get to do that. Exactly. It was n no consent fucking matters. Exactly. That's what it all comes down to. <clears throat> all these incidents and problems are cross related to the economic system in our society. The fact that a black man can't get a job. These oppressive obstacles have to be removed or they'll perpetuate themselves. Economic obstacles cause black men to commit crimes, especially around Christmas time. Many a black man who doesn't ordinarily commit crimes will go out and rob a gas station or a bus to get the money to buy his family the things that the rest of society has taught them to want. Many of the brothers just give up and leave their families. Because of this rotten system, a lot of young brothers grow up not wanting to get married. They want to be pimps and subordinate the sister. In our party, the sister is not told to stay home. If she's got a job, they take all the babies over to one house and one person, male or female, takes care of them all. We do that quite often for the sisters who have children. Then, of course, there's the liberation school, which brothers and sisters run and sisters have to learn to shoot just as well as brothers it works both ways too for instance one sister didn't want to teach charles bercy shorthand and typing because she felt that it was improper well she learned brothers can be secretaries too these principles come from huey huey has always talked about the fact that he believed in equality for men and women You'll find some women's organizations that are working strictly in the capitalist system and talking about equality under the capitalist system. But the very nature of the capitalistic system is to exploit and enslave people, all people. So we have to progress to a level of socialism to solve these problems. We have to live socialism. So where there's a panther house, we try to live it. When there's cooking to be done, both brothers and sisters cook both wash the dishes the sisters don't just serve and wait on the brothers a lot of black nationalist organizations have the idea of regulating women to the role of serving their men and they relate this to black manhood but real manhood is based on humanism and it's not based on any form of oppression fucking a okay so i just hold on Off the pig, motherfucker, and other terms. Off the pig means to kill the slave master. It doesn't mean commit murder. <coughs> There's a difference between defense and murder. Right. Some of the brothers in the party made up a song. There's a pig upon the hill. If you don't get him, the panthers will. But first one must understand what a pig is. Police, bigots, fascists. The Black Panther Party started the term. A pig is an ill-natured beast who has no respect for law and order, a foul traducer who is usually found masquerading as a victim on an unprovoked attack. Yeah. That hits right at home with the cops who all use the but I was scared defense. Right. Right. 
This definition was printed in the second issue of the Black Panther Party's newspaper in May of 1967. If you read it closely, you'll see what is really meant by pig. The police are generally referred to as such, but racist bigots and sadistic fascists who help maintain the oppression of any people are considered pigs. It is best understood when we look at the history of the KKK and Hitler's Gestapo. Huey said just before we went to press with the second issue of the newspaper, quote, we have to have some terms that adequately define the police and fascist bigots who commit murder, brutalize and violate people's constitutional rights. I told him he already called those who actually do this fascists and swine. And Huey said, yeah, but black, teen or black people aren't picking it up. It's not simple enough so they'll understand it. Chicken teenage or ch chicken. Chicken. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> Children. <laughs> Teenagers and older people. Everybody. Then Huey walking around the room thinking said swine. Pig. Swine. And Eldridge sat down at the typewriter and typed out the definition. He gave it to Huey and Huey said yeah. Emory had a drawing of a pig. We put it on the front page and wrote under it, support your local police. A uh, Birchite slogan, which is also supported by white citizen, white racist, so-called patriotic organizations. Yep. Uh, numerous reports at this time in 1967 had appeared on how the police department had been hiring Birchites, KKK members, and other white racists. Interesting, nothing has changed. Right. Like they it, still do the same. Right. It was later taken out of the news. Surprise. But police departments had doubled and tripled across this country, especially where uh, Black and other poor oppressed peoples lived in large numbers. Murder and police brutality had been going on for hundreds of years, but unjust treatment and slaughter of Black people... Uh, by racists and police, which weren't reported by the press much at all, had taken on a new high in the last 10 years. We knew that this was the working and organizing of a more overt police state right here in America. And now today, three years since the party was organized in many cities, uh, especially Los Angeles, San Francisco, Chicago, New York, and other places, police departments have been quadrupled by the hiring of many sadistic warp, warp minded blacks there are a few good policemen black and white but the majority are sadistic and racist and do not respect the constitutional rights of the people whatsoever they actually believe in brutality terror uh, terrorizing intimidating and outright murder and too many times come up acting and masquerading like a victim of an unprovoked attack huey said this defining of the police as pigs will hopefully make some of them think and oppose what the racists in the police departments are unjustly doing. It will spread to millions and millions of people who know that the cops are pigs and will hopefully generate some political movement for real community control of the police. Uh, only one political party that has ballot access in numerous states uh, supports community control of the police. And it's not red or blue. Anyway, it's green. Uh, like green. <laughs> right. I was gonna say, and it's not gold, but yeah. <laughs> uh, the police departments are acting like the old German Gestapo who called the world uh, who called the world swine, which is the same as pig. The racists in this country are exactly that by definite uh, by the definition you have typed out referring to Eldridge. Pigs, 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 Huey said. <laughs> if the people go forth using their constitutional rights to vote them out and make a real people's police force, and then if the rotten politicians don't respect the rights of the people's vote and use their guns like Hitler did, then they are officializing themselves as Gestapo and are oink oinking in the face of the people. Guerrilla warfare will have to be used then by the masses of the people. But we have to defend ourselves now. So when and if the police officialize themselves as Gestapo off the pig? Right now, if they unjustly attack us off the pig because we have a human right to defend ourselves, 
And the people must learn now that they also must defend themselves against unjust, brutal, murderous pig attacks. Eldridge, Huey, and I checked out Emery's layout of the pig for the front cover and said, right on, Emery, that's together. A low-life pig, a foul traducer, who's usually found masquerading as a victim of unprovoked attack. We were very enthusiastic about getting the paper off the press and into the streets. This will begin to let the people know how the black community sees the police who occupy our communities like a foreign troop and violate the people's constitutional rights. Damn right, Huey. Uh, Eldridge said, man, these pigs are going to shoot us down on sight when this paper hits the street and they see this. But it's the right to freedom of the press and free speech that we're exercising to educate the people as to what's really happening and what must really be changed, Huey said. So if they attack or try to kill us for this, we'll defend ourselves. We'll off any pig who attacks us. Eldridge said... Emery, you've got to do some art to show the people what to do in defending ourselves with guns and what to do in the future, because I believe from here on in, it's going to be nothing but a fascist police state, even more so than it is now. Well, Eldridge, uh, Eldridge is still alive, ain't he? I think so. I believe and so. He was having a prophetic moment there. Yeah. I was just gonna say, like, I mean, regardless of whether he's still alive now, he he saw that come true. Right. Um, also, it got worse. Oh yeah, right. Uh, also, Huey said the people have got to know that we don't believe in murder, but only self-defense in the future and in the present. They must understand that self-defense goes beyond just defending ourselves with guns. But that political organizing and implementing the 10 point platform and program are the real political, economic, and social means of defending ourselves. So the people have got to see some things that relate concretely to their problems. And the gun has got to be seen as a proper tool in defending ourselves when we, the masses, organize revolutionary programs for self determination and survival. Note that he said that it's a tool, not the tool. Right. Um, that's the only one it's one of many right right and, and that's the thing is that the platform and the program are the real goals that's the real defense um uh the 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 gun is a tool in that toolbox but the platform and program are you know equal parts there right uh There we go. I said, yeah, you know, Malcolm X said we had to deal with the basic and political and economic necessities for our people also. Huey said, and the gun. Malcolm said was for self-defense since the government won't do its job and we stand on Malcolm X's principle, which he quoted, Malcolm X had said, we should be peaceful, law-abiding, but the time has come to fight back in self-defense whenever and wherever the black man is being unjustly and unlawfully attacked. If the government thinks I'm wrong for saying this, then let the government start doing its job. Damn right. Malcolm's many speeches clearly told Americans that we must make up for past inequities and that people must understand in the language of the ghetto what off the pig means. Off the pig started being used widely when the people, black and white, were all demonstrating at the trial of Brother Huey P. Newton. It meant essentially... Don't execute Huey. Don't try to put him in the gas chamber. Put the pig in the gas chamber for murdering black people. We also wanted community control of the police. We'll patrol ourselves, we said. <laughs> so at the demonstrations during Huey's trial, there was a song, No More Pigs in Our Community, Off the Pig, It's Time to Pick Up the Gun. Motherfucker and motherfucker. Motherfucker is a very common expression nowadays. Eldridge ran it down to me once after a number of people got upset over this vernacular of the ghetto. Eldridge said, I've seen and heard brothers use the word four and five times in one sentence, and each time the word had a different meaning and expression. <laughs> Accurate. Motherfucker. Right, someone that uses motherfucker a lot. Right. I agree. Right. <laughs> Motherfucker actually comes from the old slave system and was a reference to the slave master who raped our mothers, which society today doesn't want to face as a fact. 
but today check the following sentence quote man let me tell you this motherfucker went down here with his motherfucking gun knocked on the motherfucking door and blew this motherfucker's brains out this shit is getting to be a motherfucker <laughs> With the rising consciousness of Black people learning about Black history in general, many Black youth have a tendency to say in reference to a person they may, may dislike, the dirty mother dropping the fucker part. But historically, Black men know Black women have been oppressed. And when we use the word, we don't mean that a man has had sexual relations with his mother. This never enters into a Black brother's mind. But it can be said in anger to mean just that. And the sayer knows it is completely from the truth, referring to the white exploiter, uh, exploiters and slavers in history. Looking at you, founding fathers. Right. Today, one can use the, the word to refer to a friend uh, or someone he respects for doing things he never thought could be done by a black man. In the past, the white man has always been the one who has done fantastic things. Raping our mothers was fantastically der uh, derogatory. Well, it's kind of a real complimentary statement to a brother or even a sister when one vicariously relates to someone who's black and pulls a fantastic feat. We will joyfully say, man, he's a motherfucker. <laughs> the racism and oppression of black people from history to this very day has caused this word motherfucker to be part of the vernacular of the ghetto. White boys have picked it up from black people, uh, but without the different meanings as they have developed up to the day. I would say that's probably changed at this point. I was pretty familiar with motherfucker before I ever moved to the hood. All right. To be fair, a lot of it was from like, you know, media, culture, Samuel L. Jackson. Right. <laughs> God, he says motherfucker so eloquently. Doesn't he? And he, say, and he can, he should have been the guy. I wish we had the money to reach out to Sam. No, I don't. He does Capital One commercials. But to read that quote. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it's less than 30 seconds. We could just grab a clip of him saying motherfucker. There's yeah, so it's, got, it's got to be a sentence like that. This motherfucker here went down there with his motherfucking gun, get, uh, knocked down the motherfucking door and blew this motherfucker's brains out. This shit is getting to be a motherfucker. He needs to be the one to say that. <laughs> anyway. Can't, can't argue that one. That would be um, nice. It so happens that the lumpen proletarian, the brother off the block who comes into the party, speaks this vernacular. But Huey was not one, or was one not to use it much at all. He says people, especially the older people, won't listen to the real program of the party if we use street language. Eldridge says that uh, that if we have to use it, use it in reference to the avaricious and demagogic politicians who oppress us. Because when they murder a brother or sister, then it makes us mad at the racist. Use it in reference to sadistic pigs who at least need cursing out for what they are oppressors, murderers, rapers of justice and peace in our society. I say that we shouldn't curse at all. Although after I went into the US Air Force for four years and was cursed out by instructors in basic training, I picked it up by being around GIs so much. I left the service cursing the military and my mother resents it today. So it's a tough habit to get rid of being still oppressed, but a habit we must get rid of. Huey says that even when one of us gets murdered by the pigs, we must restrain and educate the people to the correct methods. Uh, I've been well criticized, as have Eldridge, David, and many other brothers. So for the respect of the people and our mothers, we're working to break the habit. Signifying, lying or putting someone down, telling him lies about his friends or old lady trying to get him in trouble. Joe said you were a punk, but Joe never actually said anything. Vamp on. This one's kind of made a resurgence, I think. I've, I've heard it a lot in the last couple of years. Uh, when a large group of police attack you and or your friends and close associates, it doesn't necessarily always refer to the police now, but, you know, like, vamp on, like, gotcha. jump. Anyway. Uh, and close associates. In the party, it directly refers to an unjust, vicious attack, fascist in nature. 
It can also mean on a lesser level, just being busted or arrested. But I've received many phone calls or messages such as the following. The pigs vamped on the LA office. The N word. This term is not generally used derogatorily by black people to each other. There are a few very sensitive black people with self-hate embedded in them who resent it when brothers and sisters are in a general conversation in a very laughing atmosphere and say, ha ha, man, you are crazy or is crazy or say, man, this is out of sight. When we are disgusted with each other, we might say, what's wrong with you? But we aren't offended by another brother's use in this context because the use is in the context of some criticism and the criticism specifically is what we'll focus upon. College people and intellectuals have more self-hate self and they resent it most. White people use it to mean that we are backwards, stupid, innately lazy, all the derogatory connotations that can be associated with the term. Webster's Dictionary has never given this term full meaning as it's colloquially, colloquially used by both black and white people. Um, I think that we see it being used a lot less today. Maybe not among the black community, but by white people specifically. I'm not saying it doesn't get used. I'm not trying to say that racism is gone, but I think it's a hell of a lot less loud than it was in this era. Yeah, people aren't so comfortable going around saying that shit because they know they'll get knocked the fuck out. Right. Right. Um, bull, prison guard or jail guard. And guard are in jail when the guard comes around, the prisoners say, here comes the police. Or a brother will also say, police, real loud in jail. This is subtle irony. When someone in... in yeah. When someone is in jail and calls for the police, he links the prison guards, the bailiffs, and the police together. But Bull most specifically refers to the guard in prison who is circulating among the chickens, he thinks. Uh, the men resent the guard acting like he is the head rooster on the farm trying to fuck everybody. But we refer to them all as pigs when we become revolutionary. If the guard isn't trying to violate the prisoner's rights, he may be called police. But if he's trying to violate your rights like he does a lot of prisoners, uh, he's a bull. Field N-word, as opposed to house N-word. The slave in the field, working as a good, hard-working black, a field, and the slave in the master's house, a house, was a no-good bastard or an Uncle Tom and usually was more docile. He had an easy uh, deal to lose if he didn't shuffle enough. Um, fire on. In a fight, someone strikes you or you strike them with your fist, you fire on them. That one still, I think, uh, gets used a lot. Throwing iron, lifting weights. I've heard lifting iron or pushing iron. I've never heard throwing iron. Um, never heard nah. that. What was that? Bad jokes. Said I've never done hard times, so. Well, I mean, that yeah. could also be the gym or, you know, somebody please, at home please. with dumbbells. True. It's just usually where I hear the other terms that you just listed, though, is guys referencing being bored as shit in jail. Thus the bad jokes. Fair. <laughs> Knobs, shoes that are considered sharp. They're usually soft, alligator, and expensive. Pimp socks, thin men's dress nylon socks with vertical patterns on them. Right on means right on time. I've said right on forever. Same. Uh, black people used to say right on time a long time ago. It is a shortened form of identifying something that's said or done is really true and really right. Relates to something that's really correct and not negative. Right on. <laughs> Deal with. Take time to think about and work with the situation. To attempt to resolve a situation that's bad or negative, or just to go forth and complete something that needs to be done. Deal with shit. 
We all got to deal with shit. Kill. Kill in the language of the black community does not mean murder, but always comes as a reaction to someone or something that is about to unjustly attack the person or threatens to unjustly attack them. You will, you always find the word kill in very defensive language on the part of blacks. Motherfucker, I'll kick your motherfucking ass or I'll beat your motherfucking brains in means more in terms of murder. <laughs> Fair. <laughs> kill doesn't carry the same weight as kick your ass or beat your brains in. But I've said kill is generally used among blacks in a defensive manner when a black person thinks that something wrong or unjust is going to be done to him or her. Jackanate, a fool who was busted for smoking pot while selling the Black Panther or who <laughs> pulls holdups while he was uh, while he is a member of the Black Panther Party. He is not That's looked awfully at- specific. <laughs> <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> like they made up a term for it. Like this motherfucker got caught smoking pot while selling the fucking paper. <laughs> He's a jackanate now. <laughs> yeah, right. He is not looked upon as malicious or as a traitor to the party. He is seen as someone who doesn't have enough discipline or brains to be in the party, although he means well. <laughs> He's just a stoner, man. Trying to do his thing. Shit. And I will say, that's probably the one and only area where I disagree with the party is not wanting people to be smoking weed while they're doing work. Because, damn it, smoking weed helps me work. Notice. I mean, I, I agree <laughs> I agree with what you're saying, but I think that a lot of it is a product of its time. That, too. I mean, they did have to worry about getting busted by the cops if they were smoking in public or something. But even if you were just like working in the office, you know, man, I would I would still need to smoke one. It's an anxiety thing. It's an ADHD thing. Right. Anyway. So I, I have a question for you before we carry on here. Do you think that Fire we away. should read the last eight pages and just get it done with, or should we do the last eight pages next time and like have a little extra discussion at the end of it? Ooh, both are good choices. Let's see, how long have we been recording so far tonight? I honestly don't know. Oh, the thing doesn't have a, a, a counter, counter on there? I don't think yeah. so. No, it just says recording. Uh, well, um, actually, hold on, I can find out one way. Give me just a moment. We are going on two hours right now. Okay, Uh, yeah, so I think that we should, uh, so part 14 will be the final. Yeah. Which let's do that. That's fine. Um, b- besides, I'm gonna have a lot to say in this next section, which is party program serving the people. And I was just thinking, like, mm-hmm. I know it's only eight pages, but there's gonna be a lot of things to talk about. Yes, because that is an area where we're gonna have to do a deep dive, all its own. Yeah. So. All right. Um, all right. Well, uh, if that's if that's the case, then I guess we'll do the usual. Um, you know, plugging, uh, we have on our website, um, from bread theory podcast, uh, we're, you know, helping promote it and, um, cross pollinating, um, basically, but, uh, (laughs) bread theory did a conquest of bread series. And I assembled all of the videos and all of the podcast links in an easy to use, easy to navigate website. Um, I shared it around to a bunch of Facebook groups. So if you know me on Facebook, it's probably not going to be that hard to find. Um, It's also on our page. And it's also one of the more recent posts on forwearemany.org. it's simply called Partner Content, The Conquest of Bread. But we wanted to do that book ourselves, but our reading list is quite long 
as it is. So, you know, like. When a comrade has already gone there and explored that, we can share content and still have everything covered, you know? Who knows, right. there might be some stuff of ours that Zach would like to carry over to his page too. I'm gonna uh, offer him uh, the Communist Manifesto and this yeah. when the series is done. Fuck yeah. Um, but he will be working with us on anarchism and other essays. I'm really excited mm -hmm. for that. Same. I can't um, wait for that one. Yeah, yeah, same. Once again, we're doing a promotion on Patreon till the end of August. If you become a patron, we will do a one-on-one. Well, I know it says a one-on-one -on -one video, like a personalized video, but it's not going to be one-on-one. -on -one. It'll be, well, at least me and Trisha. I don't know about everybody else, but whoever's down pretty much and our new patrons. Yes. Um, we might do it as one big event, like a meet and greet. I'd really enjoy that, but it depends on what you guys want. Right. That would be cool. We could make use of those new cool backgrounds that are in Zoom where it looks like everybody's in a big group at the same table. Right. <laughs> or in yeah. the same room. Hold on. Fun hold stuff. on. There's... You're going to pop one on, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, there's room for up to 25 people in a classroom. Yep. And in an auditorium. There we go. Auditorium. Boom. There we go. <laughs> I dig it. See, all of these other seats here can be filled with you guys. And I mean, if there's more than 25 people, we can do it twice. Oh, shit. Right? That would be dope. <laughs> Hell, this would be something cool to keep going anytime that, you know, we have new Patreons coming on, maybe do a group sesh with them and sit down and talk. Yeah, agreed. Um, let's see, what else do we have going on? Um, I've been sharing around some of our, our older articles because our uh, listening base has grown and changed over the months that we've been around. And a lot of people I don't think have seen some of our early stuff, like the interview with Brandon from Cooperation Denton. Um, yeah. I shared that on our Facebook today. I think I shared it to a couple groups. If not, I think maybe a couple of the other yeah. admins might have uh, might have done so. But I do uh, remember seeing that today. I'm not sure if it was on the main page or in the groups, but I thought that was cool to kick that one out there again too. Yeah, I mean, I, I think Brandon was our first guest. And honestly, I think he was probably probably one of my favorites out of everybody we've had on. Yeah. Um, you might be seeing a new face or two on the podcast in the next few weeks. Um, you might see the return of at least a familiar face. Um depending on how you feel about that ultimately. But I was thinking about asking Jason back on. Right. Not not for Oops. anarchism and other essays, but. <laughs> <laughs> um, maybe for the next communist piece. Right, right. Yeah. But I mean, he's well read and he's he's got a good perspective on things, I think. And um, obviously we'll be introducing Zach with anarchism and other essays. Um, Hell yeah. um, let's see what else do we got that's that's it for now but I mean we'll see the the team is the team is growing behind the scenes right now maybe on the show itself in the near future who knows right but it's it's definitely right. it's already gotten easier to get things done <laughs> indeed we're we're getting into our flow that comes to the swing of things, you know. It's still a fucking roller coaster, but we found our seatbelts or something. I don't know. <laughs> something. Now there's safety equipment. Yes, safety equipment is important. So is safety meetings. <laughs> that was great. 
<laughs> anyway, so for next week, uh, remember, I just want to remind everybody again, the current event stream will be moving to Tuesdays. Um, yeah, so yep. see, you and guys, then see you guys live on Tuesday nights. And then the week after <laughs> this coming week, right? Or is it the week yeah. after that? I don't know. We talked about taking two weeks off, so it would be next, the week after next, right? When Mondays pick back up, <laughs> let's just, when Mondays pick back up, that will be for our other sessions on, you know, the Revolutionary Left Book Club. Uh, that's where we're going to start digging into anarchism and other essays, if I remember correctly, right? Yeah, yeah. And, and then, then uh, following Bobby Seal's book, we'll be taking one week off, not two, um, on Thursdays, so we can start getting our backlog of Soul on Ice, which is Eldridge Cleaver's book. Uh, on that off Thursday, we might do uh, a piece on the Black Liberation Army or, you know, a biographical piece on Fred Hampton or Bobby or Huey or whatever. Right. But we'll probably fill it with something. Right. Likely. Yeah. Because, I mean, Thursdays are, until further notice, Black Panther Day. <laughs> I'm down with that. We need to just keep that fucking going. Yeah. There's so much material out there that we can cover. And then uh, once maybe we're... Maybe doing a, a, a movie watch and maybe do it a little differently than we did the last time maybe have it be by invitation only so we're not technically broadcasting a yeah movie i that think is it should be i think protected. it should be a patreon exclusive yes and um, a true watch along where we actually share the film on screen in zoom for the other people in the zoom room um we obviously will not be able to kick that out on other media but that's something we do want to get down on with you we could watch judas and the black messiah i've got access on my streaming service love oh, that yeah. fucking movie so yeah that'd be dope um more incentive for patrons and you know what we'll, we'll get back that. to you on a date with that but yeah that's a good yeah. idea um we should open that up to not just to people who are contributing via Patreon, but anybody who contributes via PayPal as well. Okay, I'm done with that. And we can also, well, obviously I'm hoping to have the whole admin mod team in there, the whole central Fuck committee, yeah. if you will. That would be dope. Movie night, pop your popcorn, put on your jammies. Maybe I'll wear my unicorn onesie. Jesus Christ. Those are the best <laughs> fucking jammies ever. <laughs> um, anyway. But yeah, so we're, we're trying to do things for our patrons because, I mean, we didn't have anything to offer forever. And we finally put some effort into it, I guess. Um, but yeah, we're also looking for content for the website still. That'll be an ongoing call. If you write, if you make music, if you... Yes. make memes whatever hit us up all right um, other than that though i guess we will see you tuesday i almost said monday i know it's force of habit by now yeah it's been Eventually months we will remember the schedule change <laughs> of course check us out at our uh website at patreon our shit <laughs> and for we are <laughs> Or contribute to our Patreon at patreon.com slash for we are many. That's all I got. Right on. I think you covered it all. Fucking it. Have a good night, folks. Thank you for joining us. We appreciate you. We can't wait to see you next week. And the next week. And the next week. And the week after that. And the next week. And, and again, the, the following next week. week. So we're just going to keep this shit going. And the next week. And the one after that. And the next week. <laughs> <laughs>